As much as life has changed over the last year, you're still pretty busy, so consider convenient COVID-19 testing from Quest. Get the same tests hospitals use without a doctor visit. Simply order online, select from drive through or at-home options, and get results sent securely to your phone or computer. It's a great fit for your busy life. With over 25 million COVID-19 tests processed, you can count on Quest. So order your test today at questcovid19.com. That's questcovid19.com. Welcome to Star Talk, your place in the universe where science and pop culture collide. Star Talk begins right now. This is Star Talk. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist, and today is a Cosmic Queries edition. Theoretical physics. Ooh. Chuck, always good to have you. Hey, hey, always good to be here, Neil. I mean, theoretically. Theoretically. <laughs> here is, this is Star Talk in the Coronaverse. Yeah. Uh, you're sitting there in, I guess, in your Jersey home. Is that right? That. That is correct, sir. Mm. I, uh, I am the Sarah Palin of New Jersey. I can see New York from my house. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm in an undisclosed location somewhere. Uh -huh. <laughs> some, some, go some government underground bunker. <laughs> so theoretical physics, I know probably 10% of what I should to cover this myself. <laughs> so we got to bring in the big brains for this. And, uh, that takes us to uh, our close friend of Star Talk. Um, physicist, cosmologist, Jana Levin. Jana! Hey, man. Welcome back. Good to see you through the ether. Through the ether, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. I just want to get your title straight again. Professor of Physics and Astronomy at mm -hmm. Barnard College. Mm -hmm. um, why? Does that mean you get double income for that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. That's a good, but I should bring that to the provost, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, we... You know, we're pretty we're we're pretty fluid in our subject matter. Okay, we can move around. But what what it right. was, was that there the perhaps the subject should have never been divided in the first place. Well, that's a good point for sure. And but that's in in fact an interesting point that even as you well know, Neil, the word scientist is fairly modern. Yeah, like that's right. even the idea of separating science from other forms of thinking about the world or meditating on the world is fairly recent. Yeah, I think that we all used to just be called natural philosophers in the Absolutely. day. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Very cool. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm going to go with scientists is better. <laughs> yeah, you like it better? Yeah, I'm just saying natural philosopher sounds like a BS artist if you talk. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm just saying, you know. So what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a natural philosopher. Oh, a BSer. <laughs> no. Oh, no, you're unemployed. <laughs> right. right, there you go. Unemployed. Yeah. <laughs> so, check. you got the questions. I do oh, indeed, good. as usual. As usual Actually, we've, I'm going uh, to lead off with a question. Janet, we did a, we did a special Patreon Q and A a few mm -hmm. days ago, and mm -hmm. I don't know if it's posted yet. But I answered a question, and when I finished giving the answer, I don't. I was disappointed in my answer. Okay. And I just thought maybe you could come give me backup on this. All one, right. Right. So the question was, as we know, if you fall in towards a black hole, mm -hmm. if you observe that phenomenon, it mm -hmm. will slow down, and it in fact will appear to stop. Mm -hmm. just outside the event horizon. Mm -hmm. And so, whereas if you are that, well, thank you, Chuck. <laughs> Chuck, yeah. <laughs> Chuck's moving real slow right now. <laughs> so, if, and so, whereas if you are the person falling, it just happens in real time to you. You don't think about it at all. Yeah. All right. If we, the observers of things falling into a black hole, see everything freeze at the event horizon, how does the black hole ever gain mass as far as our measuring devices would ever yeah. reveal? It's, it's actually um, a little bit of a subtle question, but for a while, it's so subtle that for a while people used to call them frozen stars because yeah. they thought that they just sort of froze and never actually became black holes. Mm. But the argument is actually that if I'm falling into a black hole, I have a little bit of mass relative to the mass of the black hole. And so I have my own gravitational field. And as I get epsilon, very, very close 
to the event horizon of the black hole. I actually deform the event horizon so that it bubbles around me. And I actually fall in in a finite time, even to somebody far away. Whoa. So even wow. to somebody far away, they would have to say, so if I threw in something big, like a star or another black hole, you will see the event horizons absolutely bubble deform, enveloping each other in a finite time because of the curved space time of the other object deforming the event horizon, and it will all happen before your eyes. Wow. So what you're saying is you have your own, yeah. not your own event horizon, but you have your own deformation in, this, in the fabric of space-time. Yeah. And that will deform the event horizon for a second until it absorbs me. And then, you know, black holes are perfect. They will shed any of those imperfections very, very quickly. But for a second, it will deform, you'll get absorbed, and then it'll usually send out some gravitational waves and ring down. Wow. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like hitting a tennis ball with an invisible racket. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Chuck, okay. <laughs> so that's why, like, when we heard the two black holes collide, and it, it happened, and it was over, and one black hole formed, it didn't take an infinite amount of time. Right. And that's because both black holes were so big that their own gravitational disturbance of space-time was so strong that it actually happens to us. We really, we really see so it. They, don't, they don't freeze into their own event horizons. Right. It's really weird. Yeah, so, so the objects are both so big, and you can actually see in the simulations of the event horizon that it looks like a big barbell for, you know, it, it really deforms. Dumbbell. Dumbbell. Yeah, dumbbell, dumbbell. Somebody's and then, never uh, been to the gym, is that right? <laughs> Uh, I'm not much of a weightlifter. I don't know. Yeah. And so it happens fast, actually, okay. even, even to us from far away. Well, thank you for clarifying that, because I did not make that part of this evident in my answer. Mm -hmm. and, we'll, and Chuck, maybe we can put some indicator back to this, to this posting uh, from yeah. the Patreon Q&A that we did uh, just oh. recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Man, that is really cool stuff, though. All right, let's uh, let's go to on Patreon. Speaking of Patreon, mm -hmm. we always start with a Patreon patron because uh, Patreon people uh, support us financially. Yeah. So thank you, guys. And uh, this is Cody Kleboski, uh, or Kleboski, who says, if time is relative to a person's experience of it, is there a universal base time or is time only relative? Mm. 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 Is there a Greenwich Mean Time for the universe? <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where's Standard Time? Uh, yeah, where? <laughs> what, what have you done with it? <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, when we say things like the universe is thirteen point eight billion years old, we are referencing a particular cosmic time that on average is about the same for every galaxy. So if you are not moving relative to the expansion of the universe, the time you will measure is this cosmic time we talk about. So it's not 13.8 billion years just for us on Earth and a completely different age for somebody else in a different galaxy. As long as the galaxy is relatively slow moving, compared to the expansion of the universe, it's just kind of going along with things for the ride, then this is your equivalent kind of mean time. It's a cosmic time that we can all agree on. Wow. What you're saying wow. is because uh, galaxies have motion among other galaxies. Yeah. So, so that has nothing to do with the expanding universe. Yeah. But so this motion, you can, if they go really fast or slow, there'd be a, yeah. a time shift, a relative yeah. time shift, but that's 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 a, a detail relative to the. It's a tiny, problem. small, small correction, basically. Right. And and if you were traveling relative to the expansion of the universe near the speed of light for the entire history of the universe, you would certainly disagree about the age of the universe. You would not be saying it's it's roughly fourteen billion years. Old. I, but gal no galaxy is doing that. No galaxy is doing that. And in fact, even if they were going fast at once, it's, there's a lot of that. That cosmic expansion slows them down. They tend to slow. You know, so all the galaxies tend to kind of get very slow moving relative to the expansion of the universe. So, uh, what about the fact that as I see farther away, mm -hmm. the speed of the galaxy receding from me is getting mm. greater 
greater and greater. Yeah, it's a great so, question. Yeah. So there's some distance at which it might be receding at the speed of light. Yeah. For me, I should see no time pass for that object. Is that not correct? No. So actually what's happening is the object itself is not moving in, in some sense relative to the expansion of the universe at all. It's the space that's stretching between us. And so the space is stretching to, between us faster than the speed of light. But in most circumstances, a light beam can just still make its way over to us eventually if you wait long enough. And so if the universe is slowing down, every galaxy will eventually be visible to us as we wait long enough. Right. But if the universe is actually accelerating, which is what it seems to be doing right now, there will be a distance beyond which the light will not be able to outrace the expansion of the universe. And we will never see those galaxies. And it will be like having an event horizon like you do for a black hole. It will be a cosmic event horizon where we are never to see or know or be able to communicate with what goes on beyond that distance. Because it is receding faster than the light can overcome the stretching of the space. That's right. So the light is racing and racing and racing, but the space is stretching faster and it's never going to overcome. Okay, so the one where it is just exactly at the expansion rate for the light to exactly compensate for the stretching of the universe, if we see that light, that's going to be frozen, isn't it? Oh, so yes, in the same way that there's, so if it's accelerating and there's some, and that happens and there is something, it's an event horizon. Indeed, there is a last signal right. we will get. So if something is just on this side of that event horizon, we'll see it in the infinite future. And if something's just on the other side, the light will just seem to hover there, will never seem to get to us. Okay, but it will, wow. but will will we see it reckon time differently from how we reckon time? Ah, uh, well, it depends on what you mean by it. There, the galaxy itself could be measuring the same cosmic time. That's what I was wondering. But light, you know, almost registers no passage of time. Yeah, no passage of time, right? Yeah, but the galaxy itself, as long as it was just being dragged along with the expansion, should agree with us that the universe is about fourteen billion years old. That's the answer. Yeah. So there you go. That's it. There it is. Good light don't crack. That's all it is. <laughs> You're such a nut, Chuck. <laughs> oh, did you uh, notice I'm wearing my, I meant to show you this earlier. It's my space shuttle bolo. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> I always have to wear something themed for you, Neil. Thank you. Thank you. I feel bad because I, I, I got, I don't, I feel bad. It's quarantine. There's only so much we can do. <laughs> Chuck, you got another question. All right. Let's go back to Patreon and um, let's go to Peter Jacobs. Peter Jacobs says. Now you didn't pick him just because you can pronounce his name. Just Yes, I did. <laughs> you know, uh, because the other person's name was Flavi Flav. All right. Peter Jacobs wants to know this. <laughs> Peter Jacobs says, is energy a thing or is it just a relationship between things? Mm -hmm. uh, and he's coming to us from Queensland, Australia. Uh, good day, mate. Good day, mate. Good day. And um, actually, we have to take a break right now. Mm -hmm. And we'll come back to that because that's an excellent question. It's, it, I think it has a deeper, broader significance. Does the, me the measurement of anything does it only have meaning with regard to something else? Can it, can it have absolute meaning without regard to whoever is looking at it or measuring it? So when we come back, we will pick up Cosmic Queries Theoretical Physics Edition with our friend and my colleague, Jenna Levin. Live with luxury. Live with power in the all-new Toyota Sienna Platinum. The all-new Toyota Sienna is an all-hybrid powertrain with upgraded style and available features like all-wheel drive, a second-row captain's chairs with ottoman, and a 1,500-watt capable power outlet. Live the Sienna life. Or live with style and live bolder in the all-new Toyota Sienna XSE. With upgraded interior and exterior styling and available features like 20-inch dark wheels, an HD entertainment center, and hands-free door and liftgate. Whichever you choose, live the Sienna life. Toyota. Let's go places. 
We're back, Cosmic Queries, theoretical physics division. Ooh. <laughs> but I need help. And we got help. And we didn't have to reach too far. Uh, uh, Jan 11. Jan, uh, always good to have you. Always good to be here. Right, here. So got the question. Here. here. Yeah. Here. The, the, the here. Yeah, here. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're all okay. here. And yeah. yeah. So um, Peter Jacobs, uh, before the break, asked if energy a thing, is energy a thing? Or is it just a relationship between things? Ooh. I love that. Mm. Anna, where, where does that come from? Where's that going? I don't know. I, I thought I thought you were going to have a, a a prompt, but I'll do a quick one, and then I'd love to hear your opinion. Okay. But okay. To some, it, you know, I think it's both. So, for instance, if I'm sitting still in space, but I'm moving in time, I still so have some energy. That's what Einstein taught us. I have a kinetic energy in time, in some sense, because of my motion in time. And that's my E equals MC squared energy. And that's my basic, you can actually unambiguously break my atoms apart and get that energy out and blow things up and have real impact. Without reference um, to anything else. Without reference to anything else. But if you're, we're astronauts floating in space and I think I'm just moving in time with my kinetic energy equals MC squared in time, but you go whizzing past me, you think I'm moving past you. And so now you think I have a relative kinetic energy that I don't think I have. Uh, That's of my motion in space. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of both. Wow. It's kind of both. Okay. So in other words, okay, the way it wouldn't be both is if the question were asked whether mass energy was something relative to something else. Mm -hmm. Because right. I can measure you to have a different amount of kinetic energy in time versus... Right. Mass. I can say I have no kinetic energy in space, and you can say I have a lot of kinetic energy in space because you just saw me fly by. And we're both, because I was flying by you, but how would I know? Right. right. So, so, but if I add up your time, kinet your time energy and your spatial energy, that should be a constant no matter what. Um, so that's an interesting question. What's actually constant is a combination of my energy and my spatial momentum, my kinetic energy, yes. that com A combination of the squares, weirdly, of my energy and my in time and my kinetic energy, um, that that will be the same, even though we'll disagree about what's what. We have a way to calculate what would be the same for every observer onto you. That's right. And so it's interesting. So like, let's say you tell me that... Uh, you're looking three feet to your left. I might disagree that it's to your left. I might say it's to my left, or I'm sorry, my right. But we're gonna we're gonna agree on the the overall combination. Mm -hmm. And so it's similar with like uh, time energy and physical spatial kinetic energy. We're gonna disagree on which piece if it's how it's distributed, but we're gonna agree on a combination. Wow. Excellent. That is really okay. Good. By the way, I forgot all about that formula. We have the squares of the energies. I, yeah. I remember that now. I just like, yeah, e squared minus p squared. For my, yeah, exactly. For my relative. E squared minus p squared. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> I felt left out a little bit on that. <laughs> I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> what? Uh -huh. I feel like we could keep going, but we'd regret the rabbit hole we'd uh, fall and down. That, and that is a rabbit hole, man, for real. Yeah. But that's, so, that's yeah. a very cool yeah. question. Thank you, Peter. Uh, let's go to Facebook and Steve Cotton. Uh, Steve says, will quantum entanglement allow for FTL or instant communication to exist between worlds with light years of distance between them? This is clearly a Star Talk fan. I mean, a Star Trek fan who, who knows about subspace, which is how they get around talking to people in almost real time, even though they're in different galaxies. They have this thing called subspace. <laughs> and mm -hmm. what's it mean? Nothing. It means... Wait, 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 Chuck, just to be clear, you're laughing at it, but at least they thought about that problem and came up with a sci-fi solution Okay, all to right, it. okay, I'm going to give you that. That's... And, don't make me no, you uh, listen, me. you know what? I, I got to give it to you. That is actually, that is a seriously um, salient 
consideration. I got to <laughs> give it to you. You're right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so anyway, so, so anyway, so, go ahead. So Jana, let me let me Wait, let me I, read. I, I okay. Well, quantum entanglement allow for FTL or instant communication to exist between worlds with light years or distances between them. So, yeah. Jana, let me just ask you something. I want to mm-hmm. prep this and ask you. Do you even need quantum entanglement if you have wormholes? Uh, no, you don't need quantum entanglement right. if you have wormholes. Um, and and wormhole, you can actually put material things through the wormhole. And, yeah. and I just and open a not, portal and it's right there in, in yeah. the back door. Yeah. And Neil, as I know you've made the point before, it's not that it's faster than light travel. You've just found a shortcut. It's like somebody going uh, between New York and New Jersey by going all the way around the globe right? Mm-hmm. And thinking it's really far away. And you tell them, actually, you can just go this way, <laughs> the, the Lincoln, shorter way. The Lincoln so the tunnel. wormhole gives you a shorter oh, way. Yeah, the just wormhole the is the tunnel. Lincoln Tunnel. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so the wormhole makes a veritable shortcut where you travel slower than the speed of light and you just have a shorter distance to go. Right. And, and you're sh- sh- slower than the speed of light while you're in the wormhole. Totally. Yeah. Distance, right. Yeah. And there, you know, the other thing that I know we've talked about before is this warp drive idea, which is that it's space can expand faster than the speed of light and contract faster than the speed of light without violating special relativity or any of those laws. So you can also bring something closer, take a short step across the pond, and then push it further away again by just expanding the space. This would be awesome control over the space-time continuum to yeah. accomplish this. Awesome control. Yeah. Okay, so so what would what's more likely to happen that we Perfect quantum entanglement of faster than light communication. Oh, yeah. Or that the, we open up wormholes throughout the, the oh, galaxy. The quantum entanglement is actually happening. Like we do it in the lab. I mean, we don't do it in the scale that uh, the question was asked from one galaxy to another, because we also can't get our own selves <laughs> to another galaxy. But we can definitely do this experiment where we throw things faster than that, we throw information faster than the speed of light. Um, that's amazing. Lab. I mean, but I mean, it is that amazing. Is... I mean, I even think it's amazing. Like, I know the theory, and then you find out somebody's done it in the lab, and you're like, what? I mean, the, and no because way. the implications there are kind of like if you look at all of our telecommunications today, it started with mm-hmm. one quick one sentence, you know, Watson, come here. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, think about and, and the yeah. dude was literally in the next room. <laughs> and they thought that was like, oh my God, it's amazing. Oh, he yeah. just called me in the, I mean, you, he could have actually went like this, Watson, and Watson. Okay, and it would have been more effective. It would have been more, so I know. honestly, that's but, what you're saying is just mind blowing. But Chuck, don't you think we're, we, we're so unappreciative of how amazing this is right now? Like, I don't even know where to look. I got so many squares to look at on my screen. I, I don't even know. Like, I'm looking all over the place, but we're taking so for granted yeah. that right. this, we're doing this is amazing. Yeah. This is phenomenal. Right. We're just used to it. Wow. Yeah. So now a quick question, Jenna, is what's the difference, functional difference between a, 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 a collapsed wave function in the quantum entanglement and that information is shared at the instantly, not just faster than the speed of light, instantly. Yeah. And what's in between that and... Oh, but see, here's... Ooh, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. But instantly according to whom? Ooh, uh, so, uh, so there are some very tricky things about... Because, because in, uh, simultaneity is relative. All right, okay. And That's it. Well. That's, show's okay, over. Sorry, show's just over. To, I got to go. I'm sorry. I I can't. Dropping my headphones doesn't seem like quite as dramatic. Wow. And I am not dropping this microphone. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I do not drop them. Okay. Okay. Sorry, Neil. Okay. Go ahead. What you were saying. Yeah. So it's instantaneous uh, according to the person who does the observation. Tunneling. Mm -hmm. You, a particle is over here and there's a barrier of any kind and there's a chance it'll just show up on the other side of that barrier. Yeah. But when it does so, that happens instantly. Yeah. Um, that- um, that's, it does so instantly, but you can kind of calculate the natural time scale for it to happen. Gotcha. Okay. It doesn't, but it doesn't mean it doesn't happen instantly. 
But it does mean like, oh, do I have to wait for a Googleplex of years for this to happen? Mm -hmm. Or is it likely to happen in a year or in a second? Gotcha. gotcha. And you can do experiments where it's more likely to happen in a short period of time. So that if you do a whole bunch of them, if you put a whole bunch of particles in a box in your laboratory, you'll see a whole bunch right. tunnel through on the other side at about a second. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so you're right, it's still instantaneous, but it's just what's the likelihood of it happening in a certain period of time. Now, I, I, I got to throw this in here, just I'm yeah. being Professor Neil in this yeah. moment, but <clears throat> we knew for the longest time mm -hmm. that if they were ever going to undergo nuclear fusion anywhere in the universe, that the centers of stars would be the place that that would have to happen. Yeah. So what people did was calculate the temperature in the centers of stars. And yeah. we were getting millions of degrees, okay? Yeah. Just do the thermodynamics of that. Yeah. You run the quantum calculation, sorry, you run the calculation of is that a high enough temperature for protons to overcome their natural repulsion? You have two right. positive charges. They don't want to get close to each other. Yeah. But to fuse them, you got to bring them together to turn them into another element. So can you overcome it? They did the math and they could not overcome the repulsion. So they said the centers of stars can't be the place where this happens mm -hmm. because we did the math and we know thermodynamics. And then quantum physics gets discovered and then we learn about tunneling. Mm -hmm. And then we learn that at the temperatures in the centers of the stars, the proton can disappear from here and show up right next to the other proton bypassing the electrical barrier. Mm -hmm. And when it bypasses the barrier, it fuses, you turn hydrogen into helium. And it was the tunneling that mm -hmm. even enabled anybody to accept that stars could be the source of what? Energy. I just have to throw it. That yeah, is I amazing. Yes. The temperature is not and high I enough. I can't believe. Why have you never that. told me this story before? Well, it's not really a story, but still. <laughs> By the way, that is just at, so the, the original calculations led them to believe that this is not the place that it could actually happen. It, but, but in all fairness, uh, uh, Arthur Eddington, I think it was him, who was one of the great towering theoretical physicists at the turn of the century, a hundred years ago, someone came up to him and said, do you see? It's impossible. You can't overcome this electrical repulsion. And he said, I don't care <laughs> if there's any place in the universe where this is going to happen at all, it's going to be in the center of the star. We're going to find out one day. Wow. That's right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can kind of, you know, when you get in a zone and your numbers are off by not enough for you to abandon right, the right, idea. Right, right. They're off by enough for you to know you haven't understood everything, but not enough for you to abandon gotcha. the idea. Right, so gotcha. you stick with it. Wow, that, yeah. that is okay. super. Chuck, it wasn't yeah. to no basis, yeah, that I'm sorry. Is super <laughs> fascinating, though. That, I mean, that's, God, that's so cool. All right, here we go. Fred Pibonessa. Whatever. Fred. <laughs> <laughs> Never apply to work at the United Nations, okay? I know, yeah. I, will, I will start many global incidents. <laughs> like, what you calling me? Anyway, <laughs> uh, Chuck was doing a translation. Exactly. You gotta let him cut him some slack. Uh, he says, um, "What is space made of?" Wow, because you know we hear about the fabric of space. What is that fabric? Ooh, okay, Chuck. We don't have time to answer that until the next break. Okay, you like that? So, <laughs> love that question, and I know Jana loves it too. Look at that smile. On There's a lot that's going to come out of this one. Totally. Uh, we're gonna take a quick break. From Star Talk Cosmic Queries Theoretical Physics Edition. We'll be right. Hey, we'd like to give a Patreon shout out to the following Patreon patrons Marcus Guerra and Mahmoud Hyatt. Guys, thanks so much for the gravity assist. Without you, we could not do this. And for anyone else who would like their very own Patreon shout out, please go to patreon.com slash StarTalk Radio and support us. We're back.
back for the third and final segment of Stark Talk Cosmic Queries, Theoretical Physics Edition. I love it. We should do this more often, Chuck. Man, it's really good, really good. Of course, I need help for that. Uh, Jan 11, Jana. So, Chuck, we, we left off. Uh, we leave so, off? Uh, Fred P. Vanessa, or, right? Nope. Yep. <laughs> Uh, nope, it's... Pivo Nesta. Pio, Ven... Pio Vesana. That's what it is. Okay. Uh-huh. Pio Vesana. Okay. As... Sorry, Fred. Uh, oh, wait, wait. Pio Vesana, but his first name is Fred. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably Federico or Frederico, and they just went with Fred. He's you know? making it easier for Chuck. I know. Uh, anyway, Fred wants to know this. What is space made of? So everybody talks about the fabric of space. What what's that fabric? Is it is it? Is and let me lead into you here, um, Jana. So yeah. we like to think of just naively that okay, we, there's Earth, and then there's air, and then where there's no air, there's empty space. Yeah. So we so we have a word for what we think contains nothing. Mm-hmm. So you can't. Holding aside stray atmospheric particles that might be yeah. floating out there, that's not what we were talking about here. No. Even emptiness. if we were, let's emptiness. talk about what's between the particles. So okay. give me the most empty space you can. Yeah. Now talk about it. Wow. Well, I'm going to give an answer that I don't 100% understand or believe. Okay. <laughs> but. No, wait, Jen, let's I get say... that from talk all the time. <laughs> So, right now... <laughs> answers, he neither understands nor believes. There you go. Yeah. He chucks them out all the time. <laughs> that's it. That's, so, that's where I'm a Viking. <laughs> I think that this is... I, I would say this. I think this is how we can understand it now. Okay. And that our understanding will change. Good. With time. So, so, right now, I know that my room is full of electric and magnetic fields. And I cannot see them. But they make a fabric of the electromagnetic fields in the universe. They're just there. I know they're there because I'm looking at you right now on an electronic instrument, and, and this is just a reality that the fields are here. Even though I can't, my eyes aren't good detectors of them, my fingers aren't good detectors of them, and I don't notice them. Wait, just to be clear, the fact that light can move through empty space mm-hmm. from wherever it started to yeah. its destination, your retina, yeah. being space is permeated by yeah. electromagnetic energy. Yeah, and we can see those. We can see that version of the electromagnetic energy, the one that oscillates at just the right frequency that my eyes evolved to be able to detect. But I can't see the ones that my phone's detecting. Okay, like so when my phone goes off, I don't see like flashes. Versus microwave light. Yeah, or even not light at all, like steady electric fields. But oh. yes, most of them are usually light signals. But right now there's probably just a steady electric field in this room that permeates a whole space It's just... Okay. From God knows what, and I can't see it, feel it, touch it, because I'm my, uh, you know, it doesn't resonate with my particles very well. So I can say that there are fields that permeate the universe, and they make a fabric of that field of the electromagnetic field. I would say, in analogy, there is a gravitational field, and the gravitational field is analogous to a curved space-time. It describes the curved space-time. The gravitational field defines the shape of space-time. And my eyes are not good detectors of it, and my hands don't, don't touch it. But I fall along it. If I were to jump off my chair, I would fall along this gravitational field. And so that is the fabric of space in some sense. All right, but uh, Jana, I think that's a cop-out answer because... <laughs> <laughs> no, I like the answer. cuffs. Oh, sure, you're far away. Say that to me in person. <laughs> uh, no, I, no I, I totally followed the answer, but let yeah. me take you a step. I want to push you. Yep. Okay. You are describing what happens to be in the empty space of the universe in which we live. Can you imagine empty space through which there is no electromagnetic field <laughs> and where there is no curvature from matter. Or I yeah, I cannot imagine space as separated from a gravitational field, including a flat, empty gravitational field. 
But we, when we learn, when we learn general relativity, mm -hmm. one of the ways you start there is imagine a flat space with no matter. Yep, I still, I would still call that a gravitational field. I would just call it a flat, straight, very boring gravitational well, that would be field. A gravitational field with no sources of gravity in it. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I feel like you. <laughs> so let me put it this way: it doesn't mean it doesn't have space in it. I so let me put it this way: you're yeah. trying to give the existence of space. You're trying to credit the existence of space. I would say that's something that happens to be in it. And I'm no, no, I would say it this way. I would say there are gravitational fields even with zero sources. So I would put it that way. So I would say I take Einstein's equations, which, as you said, says put in a source, a sun, a black hole, a moon, whatever, and you will find the curvature in the shape of space-time, also known as a gravitational field. I can take Einstein's equations and put in zero sources and find as a solution a gravitational field that is just extremely plain where things travel on straight lines. Okay. Wow. So right. in other words, it's the ground state or the lowest energy state of the field and that there is no state of the field where space doesn't exist. Ooh. It just is the ground state. It is the ground state. I know. Wait, so what about a universe that mm -hmm. pops in, out in the multiverse that has no matter and no energy in it? Um, well, are you asking what it would be? Yeah. Well, this is, you know, it would be, in principle, if there are no observers, it becomes one of those questions of, there's no one to measure time. There's no passage of time. There's no experience of space. It's got to have something in it to even <laughs> ask the questions. I, okay. So, all right. But, so, but, but a universe that pops out of existence with nothing in it could just be a plain old flat space with nothing in it. I mean, I don't know. You, but you're really, you're talking about something where there's no meaning to the okay. passage of time. So how about, now let's get quantum on this. Yeah. Uh, I've read about, and I just, as you said earlier, I accept it because people mm -hmm. I trust have thought about this mm -hmm. and are far better experts at quantum physics than I am. Mm -hmm. and they describe space as a seething soup of virtual yep. particles popping in and out of existence. Yeah. Virtual matter, antimatter particle pairs. Yeah. But what is a virtual particle? So, um, this goes back to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which is really initiates the whole quantum revolution. And the uncertainty principle... Heisenberg, not from Breaking Bad, just to be clear. Oh, oh. no, but, but do you think they were fans of physics? I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. But Heisenberg, German physicist who realized that there is a level of uncertainty to how much we can know, but the real impact of what Heisenberg said is he said, in some sense, I can never know a particle is precisely there. So I can never know a particle's not there. So if I have empty space, the uncertainty principle ensures that I cannot declare it to have nothing in it because I can never say with certainty a particle isn't there in the same way that I can't say for certainty a particle is there. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so virtual particles are in some sense a manifestation of this fundamental uncertainty. You cannot have an absolute vacuum empty state. It cannot be. Uncertainty doesn't allow it. It says that there is always some possibility. How do you measure that? Being oh, you know what? We've never measured a vacuum fluctuation. And this is a really interesting, really interesting point, which is something I didn't appreciate until fairly recently. But um, we do see effects, like there's something called... The, oh, the Casimir, Casimir effect. Oh. So the Casimir effect where we put two metal plates together and it, it's a way of limiting the number of vacuum states that can exist because of these boundaries. It's sort of like excluding all, pot, not, not every possibility is allowed. And it creates a difference in the vacuum fluctuations on one side of the plates than on the other side of the plates. And that creates a pressure differential. And you can actually measure it. So I've forgotten about that Casimir effect. Yeah. So as I understand it, you have to need, you need very flat plates, very parallel, and they have to be separated from each other on the level of the wavelength 
of the of the virtual yeah, particles a, themselves. It's a, right. It's a very subtle, small, small detail, very fascinating experiment. And when you do that, they want to actually pull together with a yeah. force, a new force that just shows up because yeah. of this. And it's like saying the quantum pressure of the fluctuations on one side exceeds the quantum pressure of the fluctuations mm -hmm. on the other side because you've made it impossible for some states to exist between these boundaries, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, but, but it's not exactly a direct measurement. You don't measure a virtual particle. Mm -hmm. And so in some subtle sense, it's a, it's a beautiful indirect measurement. But mm -hmm. we, we can't be like, oh, I just saw a particle pop into existence and disappear again. <laughs> so basically what, what you're saying for Fred... Mm -hmm. is that there can never be nothing. There can never be nothing. There can never be nothing. There can never that's, be nothing. That's basically what it comes down to. Yeah. Just, yeah. Damn. Wow. So, so, yeah. Not, so not even nothing has nothing. Nothing, right. right. Nothing is nothing. Nothing, nothing. nothing is something. <laughs> Which is one of the arguments Which, by the way, by the way, I keep trying to tell my wife that. Like... <laughs> 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 um, it, it's one of the arguments for dark energy is that what dark energy is, and it's connected to the two questions, that what dark energy is... But that mysterious the, pressure in the vacuum of space. It's the mysterious pressure in the vacuum of space from quantum behaviors, and it's because even in an empty, flat space, the universe that you asked about, Neil, there is a gravitational field, and the gravitational field has an energy associated with it, and it's the energy associated with the quantum fluctuations. Wow. Okay, God, <laughs> damn. Woo, I'm exhausted. We, we, we got to do more theoretical <laughs> physics. I know. love this. I love this, theoretical physics. It's amazing. This, this is, is this is crazy stuff. Yeah. yeah. This is crazy. I got to tell you the truth. I am so sorry that I spent so much of my young life uh, <laughs> doing drugs. I could have been doing. I could have been doing this. <laughs> this. This is just as good. I could have been easily. I was hanging out with the wrong. Here I am hanging out with the stupid people who want to smoke weed and drink. I should have been hanging out with the doggone physicists. I know, I'm man. I'm telling you. That's, Dad. That's, how, that's how we roll. <laughs> Jana, always great to have you on. We, always we, fun to be on, guys. We need more installments of theoretical physics. So yep. Yeah, happy to. Yeah. Anytime. And everyone hang in there. It's good to see you all. Thank you. In the coronavirus, Chuck. In the coronavirus. Stay safe. Definitely. A pleasure. Stay safe, guys. All right, safe, good. Guys. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist, signing off from Cosmic Queries Theoretical Physics Edition. As always, keep looking up. Mm -hmm.